Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're fast approaching the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, and uh, moving on, this part of the church year, um, as we get closer to the end of it, more end time stuff, we're not quite there yet, but Jesus, I think, is warning us about that coming in our, in our reading, in our gospel reading primarily, but also uh, in the uh, uh, other parts of the readings, we're going to be talking about how um, the Lord does watch over us and he does bless us. Um, and uh, that we can take great comfort in that. Uh, I'm going to start out with the intro. It's on the back page from Psalm 135. Um, and um, I think it just that serves as a good place to start because, well, we'll see. Uh, your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give thanks or th give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. I hope I didn't give it away emphasizing certain words or anything. But, no, I just want to point out that there are a few times where we heard the phrase, O Lord, and if you notice, how is it spelled? How is uh, it spelled? All capitalized, which tells us um, that it is the word Yahweh. I am who I am. This is the name that God gave to Moses. If you remember Moses at the burning bush, God says, I want you to go back to Egypt. And Moses along the way says, oh, by the way, wh whose name should I say is sending me? That's important. He says, uh, I am who I am, Yahweh. So that was, in the English translation, whenever you see those are capitalized, that's, that's the name. So it is the, the name Yahweh, I am who I am, um, and the one who does all, and all that goes along with it. So we have this, your name, and that's going to come up in the gospel reading uh, about using the name of the Lord or the Lord's name. Uh, but in all of this, as we say this, our response to the name of the Lord what the Lord has done is that we praise the Lord. You heard that a couple times. Praise the Lord, PTL. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, I had a professor at the seminary who would often say, "Praise the Lord." He would. That was what he would. He would just say that, um, and uh, kind of reminded me of that as well. Um, but you know, giving thanks to God, giving praise to God for all the blessings that He has given to us as we stand in the house of the Lord. You know, sing to His name. You know, his renown is throughout all generations. The Lord vindicates his people and has compassion on his servants. So this very kind of a general praise kind of thing going on in this psalm, uh, but it's directing us, oh, the name of the Lord. I am who I am. I am there in the beginning. I will be with you. Uh, and as you remember, uh, especially in John's gospel, Jesus uses that phrase, I am, I am the good shepherd, I'm the light of the world, I'm the resurrection of life, seven times. I mean, seven times. So this, he's, you know, Jesus is equating himself with being God. So that's what's, that's what's going on with that. So that kind of starts out with um, what, what that's all about. So let's jump back to the Old Testament reading in Numbers chapter 11. Um, this is about a year after leaving Egypt. So they're at Mount Sinai. They spent about a little over a year at Mount Sinai. Um, and uh, after a year, the people um, start to complain. Surprise, surprise. surprise. <laughs> um, and, and um, well, let's just, let's just hear what it has to say. I mean, Moses is done. The people are done. The Lord then does a wonderful thing. Uh, now the rabble, I like that word, now the rabble that was among the children of Israel was a, had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. 
But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. So if you remember, God provided food. They would wake up every morning. They would collect enough for the day. And on the sixth day, they collect enough for two days. Uh, God provided water along the way. But they're, I mean, they had to do anything. They just had to go out and get it. Uh, and every, that's what they had to do. Um, now, what's very interesting in the book of Exodus, nowhere do we read how they sat around and ate fish and cucumbers and melons and leeks all day. If you read the book of Exodus, you probably remember that they were not sitting around all day. They were making bricks. This was hard work. Um, and so um, short-term memory. I always find it very interesting uh, when, you know, Pastor, we remember when things was so much better. And then I go back and I read, it wasn't so much better. We want to believe it was so much better, but usually... It wasn't. I mean, that's usually how that goes. Not, some days are better than others, but with that. So that's what's going on. Now, verse 10. Uh, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly. And Moses was displeased. I mean, God was getting angry with them. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? that you lay the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they wept before me and said, give us meat that we may eat. Give us eat meat so that we can eat. Give us meat. Didn't they have the... The, Raven, quail, the, ravens the quail's the coming quail. shortly. Oh, that, that comes, for, that, that that come comes at the same No, time. they didn't. Oh. Manna first <laughs> you know with that. some water, and then the quail is coming shortly. In know. fact, right after, after this reading here, we, we read about that. Um, but they have this cute little saying, give us meat so we can eat. You know. uh, I'm not able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I found favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. So Moses, you know, God calls him. He leads the people out. And do you remember how many people came out of the Exodus? Just, it was 600,000 men, because they only kind of men. But if you do the math, if there's 600,000 men, there must be 600,000 women, and then 2.3 children, or whatever. Had to be on the lowest side. Right on the lowest side. I'm sure there was much more. So, I mean, they, they would, could be three to four million people. And Moses asking, you know, he asked, where am I going to get meat for everybody? I just can't go to Ken's meat market and say, I need meat for 4 million people. I mean, you know, he's, he's and it's too, and Moses, this is too much. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. Just take my life. I'm, and so the Lord is listening to this. The Lord said to Moses, and if you notice, verse 16, how is Lord spelt? Capital. Capital. So it's Yahweh. Gather me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand uh, there with you. Um, and so Moses by himself, he probably, I mean, he had Aaron there, but how much, you know, Aaron is being doing priestly stuff. But these other 70 men who were leaders in, in, the, in the clans, in the people of Israel, God says, bring them to me, bring me and stand in front of the tent. So the tabernacle. If you remember, Moses has been allowed to walk in the tabernacle. He will have a discussion with God, and then, um, then he comes out and he tells people what God has said. And so now God says, okay, I'm going to give you some help. Uh, so, verse 20 more, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. As soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now that phrase, and they prophesied, is a, it's a, we read that, well, what is exactly what that, what does that mean? I mean, what does it mean to prophesy? I mean, if you just use the prophets prophesied, and what was the job of the prophets? That's right. It's just to proclaim. I mean, that was, that's the, they were, they, if we were to put it in today's terms, 
they began to preach, maybe teach. So he says, okay, I'm going to take some of the spirit from you, Moses, and I'm going to put it on these 70 guys, and they were going to begin to, to preach and teach. I think part of this, and, and, and we find out that everybody went to Moses with all their problems, everything, four million people. Huh. That just would be, I mean, I could see that would be overwhelming. Um, and now they're going to have this, and then we're going to find out later that not only were these 70, but they had guys under them who had guys under them, and so it would spread out. So, um, and they would just go up the, just go up the the, the 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 line until they got until it was bad enough that Moses had to hear about it. Then Moses would take care of it. So it they it did that. So, but now two men remained in the camp. One named Eldad, and the other man uh, other named Medad. So they were part of these seventy <coughs> uh, elders. And the spirit rested on them. And they were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. Now, we don't know why they didn't go. Maybe they didn't get the memo, the text. Maybe the internet went down. I have no idea. Uh, but they didn't go. But they were among the 70 elders that were chosen, that were registered, as it says here. And so they begin to speak. I'm sure that would have been interesting not only for them, but people around them going, ooh, who is this? This sounds like Moses. But it's not Moses. Now, and a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses stopped them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So Moses, you know, going, uh, you, don't, you don't have to be worried about me. I mean, they're not taken away from me. The Lord gave them that ability to do that. In fact, Moses even goes on to say, I wish all of them would have the spirit and prophesy and speak the words of the Lord. So, you know, Joshua understandable. Well, we got to protect Moses. He's the leader. We don't want them going outside, you know. And Moses says, don't worry about it. We're good. It's from the Lord. The Lord's doing. And so we have this, you know, Moses overwhelmed. God provides people for Moses. And now Moses is going, oh, how I wish all of them could do that, which would be much, much simpler for Moses because then they would know the word of the Lord, what was happening. The Lord would speak to Moses then Moses would speak to the people. Now it's going to go to the 70 and da, 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 all the way down so that it would be spread out. So that was a good thing. So the Lord not only provided food for the people, which they still complained, but Moses was given help, which is wonderful, fantastic. You know, that, that, that would happen. All right, jump over to the gospel reading in Mark chapter 9. This will conclude Mark chapter 9. We've been reading through this for the last couple, about three weeks. Um, so if you remember, beginning of Mark chapter 9 is the transfiguration of our Lord. So Peter, James, and John, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah up in the mountain, da-da-da-da. They come down arguing. The disciples can't cast out the demon. Um, and uh, what's going on with that? Then Jesus asks the question or tells them, I'm going to suffer, die, and rise again. And along the way, they're having this argument, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And so this comes after this. So John said to Jesus, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he's not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So this is kind of going back Old Testament. Oh, El Dad and me, Dad, they're speaking. And Joshua said, oh, you should stop them. Well, John's going... They're casting out namens or demons um, in your name, Jesus, but they're not one of us. 
They're not one of the 12. They're not in the core. They're not in the group. Um, But Jesus says, don't stop them. If they're doing it in my name, let him do it. Because if if they're for us, they're not against us. So that kind of the Jesus saying, it's okay. It's okay, John, that this is happening, that they can make that happen, casting out demons. Now, if you remember right before this, what couldn't the disciples do right before this? When the father brought his son who was demon possessed, he couldn't, they couldn't cast out the demon. So I think part of this is Jesus, why does he get to do it? And he's not one of us. You know, I think there's a little jealousy going on with why can't we do this, Jesus? And remember, what did Jesus say? In order for that to happen, you had to pray. So totally trusting in Jesus to do that great miracle. So he says, you know, he's one of us. Now, he's not in the inner 12. He's not even in the inner three, but he's still part of, of, of the kingdom of God. He's still part of the family, as I'll put it that way. That, that, we, that, we, that we, he can continue to do that. We know people who are not part of the Lutheran church who believe like <coughs> Lutherans. That's okay. Because they get it. They get it. That's okay. I know many Roman Catholics who are very good Lutherans, but they don't know they're good Lutherans. <laughs> That's okay. Many Baptists, many Methodists, many, you know, solely trusting in God's grace, believing that Jesus is their Savior, that n- no works can save them. Works are just a response to the faith that they have. They get that. There are many who get that. You know, that, and that's, that's all right. With that, that's a wonderful thing. Oh, how, how I wish, I'll use Moses, oh, how I wish they were all Lutherans. But God can, you know, use that. God can make it happen. So that's, that's okay. That's okay. Now, verse, any questions on that one? It's the next part that's going to be, we're going to have to work through it because Jesus is very harsh, very harsh in his words. Um, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, we like to quote that a lot. We like to, oh, yeah, if you cause one of these little ones, it would be better. And and the, the millstone was what was used to grind up the wheat to make the flour to make the bread. That was not a light thing. It was very heavy. And so we do that. Now, he goes on. Now, I'm glad this is metaphoric and allegoric, meaning it's not literal, because none of you would be here, because you wouldn't be able to walk and drive and see. So this is what he says. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. Hmm. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I'm going to stop there. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, um, if you had your Bibles, if you have Bibles here, I would say let's go look down at the study notes as to what is, what is Jesus making reference to here about being thrown into the unquenchable fire, being thrown into hell. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> in, the, in the original, it's, it's Gehenna is the, is the Greek word that, that is used there. Um, this, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. At the end of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 66, the, almost like the last verse, uh, Isaiah uh, talks about, beginning kind of a couple chapters or a couple of verses before, it's about those who are saved, the believers. They are saved. God will bring them home to heaven. They are saved. And then he goes on to say, what will happen to those who are not saved? Those who reject, those who do not believe, and it's this phrase, they're going to be thrown in the unquenchable fire, to be thrown into hell, where worm does not die and fire is not quenched. So Jesus is making reference to Isaiah chapter 66. Now, anybody who's listening to that 
way back then when Jesus is saying it, if, if they're like, like they're listening to the Elvis and they would go, I, I know what that means. That means that there is a hell. There is going to be punishment for those who reject, those who go their own path, go their own way. So Jesus is very, you know, I mean, he is saying this, I think, for shock value for people to listen. The very fact that he says, cut off your hand, cut off your feet, gouge out your eye. This is for shock value. People are going, what, what? really? Who, why would you do that, Jesus? What? That seems rather... Now, the real question is this. Is it really your, your hand or your foot or your eye that causes you to sin? Really, what? It's your heart. It's the heart where Jesus has said, sin, you know, the early, about a, six weeks ago, in the chapter before this, Jesus says, you know, he lists all those things, but it really starts with the heart. It's not what goes in that causes us to sin. It's what comes out. And he, and he says we have, we all have heart problems, lack of faith, if you want to put it that way. So we, that, that's what that is. And so Jesus is warning, saying, um, uh, yeah, God is a God of justice. I mean, there's law and there's gospel. Yes, God wants to save. He wants all people to be saved. But if you don't think you need to be saved, let me tell you where you're going. This is gonna, and, and, and I like to put on your, where you wear masks forever. <laughs> that doesn't scare people straight. Well, I'm just kidding. I didn't mean to pick on anybody. But, you know, those things. So Jesus says this for, for shock value because he doesn't want anybody to be damned. So he, he gets their attention. Then, verse 49. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So the question is this. What is Jesus talking about? Salt? Fire? Losing its saltiness? Have salt, and there's no direct old. Well, I shouldn't say that. In the Old Testament, when uh, people brought their sacrifices to the Lord to be sacrificed, some of the sacrifices God required that there would be salt that was added, salt to the sacrifices. So they would burn up the sacrifice and the salt that was with it. So you have this little reference to have this salt with you. Now the question is, well, what does that mean? What, 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 is, what does salt represent? Now if we say, be salted by fire, just thinking in spiritual terms, who, I'm going to say it this way, who would be the fire? If you're salted with fire. Now, Holy Thank you. Now, this is very confusing because we just got before here, fire quenched doesn't, I mean, that's hell. But then Jesus does this shift, and we're reading it, da-da-da-da-da. I mean, it could have been, he's done with verse 48. Pauses, 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 pauses. Oh, yeah, for everyone, you need to be salted with the fire, with the Holy Spirit. So hence, and I'm going to be of this camp, Salt equals what? Thank you. Faith. That we have this faith that is given to us. That the Holy Spirit comes to us, waters of holy baptism, through the word of God. We are given that salt. And then, our, then, then that salt, we are to season in our lives and what we do. Did any of them get? What did I don't know. I don't know. I think it was one another one of those, what's he talking about? I have no idea. What's he talking about? It's not till, and I think for all of them, the until Pentecost comes, till the Holy Spirit comes, and then I think even with that, they're going, okay, what do you mean by, I mean, as we try to, you know, explain what this all means. I mean, there, I mean, Jesus makes these all these references to the Old Testament, all these little things, now, which they probably would have a better understanding than we do many times, because we don't always go back to the Old Testament. Um, so they would go, what? I mean, salt purifies? 
Yeah. Preserves. Yeah. So kind of. You, you wonder why he spoke in such. Par- it's these are parables. Yeah, I know. They're but, you know, it's I parabolic know. language, and it it was that I think in Mark's gospel earlier on it says, and that's why he he people did not understand. That's why he spoke in parables, which would make it even harder to understand if you're thinking and speaking in parables. Going, what are you talking about? So he would do that. <laughs> and it's one of those questions. Of, well, yeah. well, part of his Old Testament prophecy that that's what the Messiah would do. He would talk in parables going okay these earthly stories that supposedly have heavenly meanings but we have no idea what some of them are easy to make the connections others like this you're going well does salt ever lose its saltiness i don't know some say no i mean salt is salt i don't know not that i'm trying to confuse you anymore but i'm still you know wrapping my brains around this but this have salt, have faith in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. Remember, right before this, they're arguing who's the greatest. I mean, they are, and like I said, I'm sure Peter, James, and John are going around and said, we know something you don't know. We saw Jesus, but we can't tell you this. Oh, it was awesome. And, oh, Moses and Elijah was there, you know. And they're going, oh, we could do better than that. Da, 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 da. And Jesus is going, no. That, that, you're missing the whole point here. Live at peace with one another. At peace. So this is what's going on here. So you, you have this, you know, that first part kind of reference back to the Old Testament where Jesus is saying, hey, if they're doing it in my name and they're for us, let them continue. Because if you, you just don't do that. I mean, if you're for us, you're not going to speak evil of us in the next breath. So let them do that. And then Jesus goes on about causing others to sin. Causing, you know, so he's reminding the disciples and you and me that we are following Jesus. Doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want. I mean, our life has to be a life following Jesus. Now, do we sin and mess up all the time? Most definitely. Do we ask for forgiveness? All the time. Does God forgive? Yes. Yes. So we try to do uh, our best in, in doing that um, in, in living that out. All right, question? Yes? Who, is, who did you say is the fire? The fire is the Holy Spirit. What? The Holy Spirit, which I equate on Pentecost. Remember the flames of fire? Yeah. That, there are many experts, but I'm, this is the one I'm... Today, this is the one I'm leaning towards. <laughs> Ask me tomorrow... It might change again. But I, I, as I, that, yeah, I wish Jesus would have had a little footnote saying salt equals blah, 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 and fire equals, but we're, we're trying to figure this out. Yes? Could you talk a little bit about verse 48? Where there one does not cry? Yes, that is from Isaiah chapter 66. That is a quote, direct quote from Isaiah chapter 66, where Jesus is saying, this is what's happening to people in hell. He says, where the worm does not die. Well, what, I don't know. What are they talking about? It's a, a, what do er, worms eat? Dead flesh. Dead flesh. But can you imagine being in hell, even though you're dead, but you're not dead, but the worm is still mm-hmm. eating Is it just you. a picture of the, the horrors? I think death. it is. I think it's, you read that last couple verses in Isaiah uh, 60, and you're going, there. how could you end the book on this such morbid thought that, okay, this is what hell is like. You don't want to go. You want to make sure you're not there because this is what it's like. It's, it's even worse than living in Detroit. <laughs> Just kidding. But that, I mean, that's what that is. So that's where, that because that seems a rather odd, why would Jesus say, but he's du- directly quoting Isaiah 66, the last verse in Isaiah chapter 66. Yes. Verse 42. Um, of course, you know, you watch TV and, and all these people that traffic young girls, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Well, of course, that's what it's talking about. Can it also mean leading little ones to sin? 
been by your example? Yes. Even more. Even more. I mean, Jesus is, is this is not, there's no, um, <clears throat> you know, what do they call that? Escape clause. There's no, you know, we can weasel out of this. Jesus said, if you cause one of these little ones to sin, it would be better. And what is the greatest sin that we can teach our children? Rejection of the Spirit. Or, in order for you, yeah, in order for you to be saved, you have to, da, 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 which is rejecting the Holy Spirit, rejecting God's grace. I mean, that is, you know, you know, I always cringe when I read or hear on the internet or whatever, we must teach our children to have faith and obey in order to be saved. And I'm going, we're saved by God's grace through faith, period. Obedience comes in sanctification. Obedience comes after we are saved. It's not part of our salvation. You couldn't, you couldn't obey enough in order to fix, to do your part in order to be saved. I mean, that was Luther's whole thing in the time of the Reformation. How much do I need? God did his, Jesus did his part. Now I have to do mine. Well, how much do you have to do? I mean, but you can't do enough. There's no way, no how. So I think it could be as simple as a simple, but great sin that way. Or, you know, and you can go the whole the whole thing, which is once again going. None of none of us, if we thought if we knew that, none of us would have children, because we would go, oh, what a great responsibility. I mean, I mess up all the time, all the time, and by God's grace, my children might be okay. <laughs> Thank God for the, their mom, because, you know, that, and teaching them that we are saved by God's grace. We don't go to church because we have to. We go to church because we want to. Now, are there times when we have to make them go to church? Oh, yes, so that they realize we want to go to church. That law gospel, that, that balance that we have, you know, that we deal with. And remember, the only person who did it perfectly was Jesus. We're doing pretty good if we get a C minus, B plus whatever the case may be. So we have that. Any other questions from that? I mean, that's a, this is a, this is a harsh gospel reading. It's one of those, this is the gospel of the Lord kind of things. Really? Woo. All right. James chapter five. Now, I gave you the whole thing. Uh, I think for this Sunday, um, we are reading just, Verses 13 through, uh, through 20. Uh, it was one of those, you can do either or. So I just, I just threw it all in there because I, I don't know what Pastor Stecker is doing. Um, he's back. <laughs> of course, he's not here right now. I have no idea where he is. So that's all right. Probably. I told him to take a couple days and get reacclimated. Um, and so... Um, Coming towards the end of the book of James, I think next week we move into another book, um, towards the end of the book of James, and um, he's, he's really getting down to the nuts and bolts of the Christian life and how, how it looks, what the Christian looks like, life looks like in everyday examples. I mean, I mean it's, it's the, the actions. I'm going to read the whole thing. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the uh, miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Uh, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached out the ears of the Lord of hosts. Uh, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned 
uh, you have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So just pleasant thing for all those rich people, which technically we all are. I mean, if we were to compare ourselves to the rest of the world, we are. But what is James is really saying here for the, the rich people, but those who trust in their riches instead of trusting in the Lord. All, all that stuff is going to, it's not, you know, not going to be there. As we sit there and we come on judgment day, and I like to think of it this way, there's only one thing you can hold on judgment day that will get you into heaven. Either you're going to hold Jesus or you're going to hold something else. And if you hold that up something else, it doesn't get you in. I mean, I, I, Jesus, that's all I have. I, that, I, I can't get in without Jesus. Verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that... Uh, you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. An example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those, uh, those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of their steadfastness of, of Job and have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Uh, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or earth or by an oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. So, you know, be patient. As the farmer plants a seed, I always find it amazing, you know, that in March, April, the farmers will put their stuff out, and if you look at the, it's, you know, by the end of next month, they will have harvested everything off the fields. I, didn't, I, I find that amazing. Every year it happens. I should not be surprised, but I'm surprised. Oh, there it is. So, so we have that. And then, being careful what we say, who we judge, who we don't judge, um, and and things like that. So that's just kind of a, so there's a lot there. But this 13 and following is, well, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Uh, for the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it had not rained on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will, will cover a multitude of sins. So, as part of the family of God, having faith, that salt that's given to us, our response to that is that we help and serve one another. We see someone in need, obviously we pray, most definitely. There's a lot going on in our world. My wife says, what can we do? I said, first and foremost, the greatest thing we can do is that we can pray. We pray to God. She goes, I've been doing that all day. I said, great. We continue to do that. And then, if the Lord leads us, and there are specific things that we can do, then we can do that as well. Whatever that is. Whatever that might be. Now, this whole thing about if a brother wanders off and the one who went to save him saves his soul, we would go, wait a minute. So if I save enough people, I'll save my own soul? No. <laughs> no, that person went out because I like to say that the person who went out, he's already been saved, and he's bringing others to the fold. Sins are covered? Yes, Jesus already did that. That's what happens. Um, and so uh, we have that. So a lot going on here. So in, you know, your name, O Lord, the one who comes, we, we praise him, we bless him. Old Testament, 
oh, wait a minute, they're speaking, you know, tell them to stop. And Moses says, no, no, I wish all of you would speak. All of you, Jesus. Oh, he's casting out demons. Oh, that's okay. He's for us. Oh, by the way, let's talk about something that's really important. Don't cause other people to sin. Ooh, Jesus. Oh, by the way, we'd be better if you didn't have feet and hands and eyes than enter into, you know, you know, enter heaven that way instead of the other way. But have that so how have that faith, and that faith expresses itself in love toward God and toward the neighbor. So that's what's going on there. All right. Go to the intro, or not the intro, the calc of the day on the back page. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing. So every blessing comes from God. Mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So if Jesus, God, the Heavenly Father, is the source of every blessing, and then we say that you would give us works. So the works that we do is blessings that God gives to us so that we can bless others. So when God, you know, lets us know that there are people who are in need, we are blessed with that so that we can be a blessing to others. Of course, the greatest thing we can do for others is pray. The greatest thing. Don't, I mean, I think we, we say, oh, I, I can only pray. But that's huge. That's the best thing. And then, if God wants us to do others, he'll use us to do that. To do that. Questions, comments? I did say a lot today. And you should see my, if you ever watch my video, usually I don't have so much writing on it. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. So people who watch the video at home, they're going to go, what is going on here? So today was a lot of stuff. Yes. In uh, James, Um, yes, um, and Jesus makes reference to this as well. I don't remember which gospel it is, but he talks about what would happen was uh, people would come and they would and they would say, uh, "Do you swear?" They will. I swear on my mother's grave. I would swear uh, on the temple of the Lord. I would. Swear, I mean, and Jesus going, and this would be a long, drawn out process. And Jesus would go, um, "Are you, are you going to pick up the milk today when you come home from work?" Just yes or no. I, that's all I need to know. I mean, it was that it was became ridiculous. So that's so James is kind of going with that. He says, you know what? Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. I mean, it, it just it. You know, do we swear sometimes? Yes. When a couple comes up and wants to get married, you know, do you promise before God? Yes. I mean, we do that. You go in a court of law. Yeah, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You know, we do do those things. Um, but, you know, but this was, this goes back to, um, you know, will, will you pick up a, yes, I swear my mother's grave on the temple of the Lord, and ba da 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 Okay, are, are you getting the milk or not getting the milk? I mean, what's going on? Just say yes or just say no. It's okay. Like unnecessary. Yes. Um, and it became so dramatic. And, and I'm, you know, Jesus, how he says, just say yes, just say no. <sighs> Besides, when you start swearing on other things, then you, you have no right to do that. I mean, how do, you, how do you swear on the temple? That's where the Lord is. So if you don't do it, then whom, if you say you're going to do it and you don't do it, then who have you made out to be a liar? The Lord. Because you swear on the temple, that's where the Lord lives. You know, just yes or no. It's that simple. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.